We are going to be in 1 John 4. Kyla, go ahead and put the title slide up there. I know I jumped right to that, so you were on it. This is my mistake. That's the that's series title. Go to the next one. There you go. Love is spiritual. Uh, I just want to kind of talk about this a little bit before you actually see it in the scriptures to understand what this means. Many times when we talk about love, um, we think of the love between a husband and a wife. We think of the love of parents for their children. We, we have this very um, unique picture in our mind of what love looks like. And we are going to talk about that. But you need to understand that love at its core is spiritual. This is very important because Jesus says that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible also says that God is love. It doesn't say that God or that love is an aspect of God. It says that it is literally who he is. The Bible also talks about how we've never seen God. Jesus is the manifestation of God in the flesh. And so as we go through this scripture, I want you to really begin to think about this and have some repentance and the idea of change your mind of what love is. Because love in our culture is under attack. Love is becoming something that is completely carnal, and it is a feeling. I have counseled with people. Um, I have talked with people. How many times maybe you have friends or you've experienced in this in your own relationship, and things are like a horrific train wreck, but the, the answer inevitably comes, but I love them. I see this a lot in marriages where husbands are physically and mentally abusing their wives. And the wife's response is, but I love him. We're having more and more a stranger view of love. Now it's, if I am a man and I fall in love with a man, I can marry the man because I can't help it. I love them. Love is becoming more perverted and more twisted. And I really believe that this is why we must understand that love is spiritual. Because if God is love, that is the precedent of love. Any other form of love is not love. Let me say that again. Any form of love that is not God's type of love is not love. Okay? So love is spiritual. It is not carnal. Now, it can manifest certain ways because we can't just say, well, you know, love is spiritual, so that means I can treat people like garbage. No, the Spirit is in you. If the Spirit of God is in you, you will manifest or you will carry out acts of love. And this is what I want to show you instead of me just telling you about it, to be able to see this in the Scriptures. So in 1 John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but the end of your Bible, 1 John, verse 4, starting at, so, sorry, 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Isn't that interesting? The trait of being born again and knowing, as in the form of intimacy, knowing God, not knowing about God, not knowing his name, but knowing him in the most deep, intimate way, is anyone who loves. It does not matter how many spiritual gifts you're operating in. It doesn't matter how many people you've raised from the dead. I encourage you to raise people from the dead. That's really awesome, and that's another thing that Jesus commands us to do. Uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. But it is not the sign of one who is born of God and knows God because Jesus himself says, in the last days, people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not? And then list all of their spiritual gifts. And he says, I'm sorry, I do not know you, you who practice lawlessness. 
Do not trade one for the other. Do not go, oh, well, then I'm just going to focus on love and I don't need to operate in spiritual gifts. No, operate in spiritual gifts is a natural outflow of your love. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, if I have prophecy, if I'm able to give all my money away, but I have not love, I am nothing. He doesn't say if you do one, don't do the other. He's saying everything that you do by the spirit of the living God is an outflow of love because love is the spirit. Does this make sense? The world, the world is tired of hearing from people who identify as Christians who hate them. And you know, like, y y people say this all the time, well, what do I care what the world thinks? You should care if the world makes the statement, you know, I would probably be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians. Now, we can flip the other way and go, well, you know what, you shouldn't base this on Christians, you should base this on God, nobody's perfect, and all of that kind of stuff. But again, I'm not talking about perfection, I'm talking about focusing on a singular thing, which is the beginning of this. Love one another Everyone who loves, and I mean the love of God, everyone who loves God's way is born of God and knows God. That is a promise. If you are a radical lover of people, loving people God's way, not meaning you love them until circumstances change or you love them until X, Y, and Z happens. If you are a radical lover of people, that is a sign that you are born of God and that you have a deep, intimate relationship with God. And it has to be that way because how many of you feel sometimes that loving certain people in this world is impossible? Take heart because with God, all things are possible. And without him, they're not. So I'm with you on that. Loving certain people, I think um, we talked about this before, your sandpaper person. You know, the person that rubs against you and it does not feel very good. Okay, you, everybody has a sandpaper persons or sandpaper people that you're, you just see them coming. You're like, oh, no. I hope they don't want to talk to me. We need to move past that, and you will be able to love your sandpaper person, even though it feels impossible, because with God all things are possible. That's a sign that you are born of God and know God. That's just the very first verse, and there's so much there. And it tells us that the opposite is true. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And we already said, God is, Jesus himself said, God is a spirit. So if God is love and Jesus says God is spirit, that means love is spiritual. If you are an unbeliever, if you are a worldly person, there's some people out there that are just really nice. You meet them. They don't know Jesus, but they're just super nice. They're not loving people, though, because you cannot love God. You cannot love people unless you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. By this, verse 9, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. So it's saying, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son. So God's manifestation of love, like if we say, well, God loves us. Well, how do we know that? The manifestation, the, in, the, the, the physicality of Jesus coming from heaven, being born as a human being, fully God, fully man, everything that he did in ministry, everything that he finally did at the cross and cried out, it is finished, that is what love looks like. And this is very important because, again, our world, Satan is the deceiver. He's the liar. So if he can get us to say, yeah, but this is also love, and this is love, and this over here, this is love, it's not true. Jesus set the precedent for what real love is. Verse 10, in this is love. So first it's by this is love, God sending his son. In this is love, I love this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son 
to be the propitiation for our sins or the sacrifice. This is so important because many times we as Christians define love by our love for God. Oh, I really love God. I spend a lot of time in my secret place. I spend a lot of time in the Word. I spend a lot of time praying, all of this kind of stuff. So I must really love God. This scripture says specifically, in this is love, not that we loved God. And I've said this in here before, and, 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 and this has been preached, and I'm not coming against preachers that say this, but I, I think it's, it's very, very important. Many times we want to mix law and grace. We want to mix the, the, the covenant of the old and the covenant with the new. The covenant of the old is when someone asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you do this, you will complete the whole law. And so many people today will tell you or will preach, well, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Everything in Christianity can be summed up with love God and love people. And I get where they're coming from, and their heart is in the right place, but that is not true. Because according to this, love cannot be defined that our love for God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins, of the sacrifice. And look at verse 11. It's talking about the old covenant. Love God, love people. In verse 10, verse 11 is the new covenant. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Old covenant is love God and love people as you love yourself. How many of you know that we have an entire generation of people that are not loving themselves? And so, you know, there's sometimes we get, in the, uh, get up and look in the mirror and be like, I am looking pretty ugly today. Are you going to go out and tell somebody else that they look ugly? Because that would be loving them as you just loved yourself. So what Jesus is saying is the whole law is love God and love others as you love yourself. Jesus, the Bible says, fulfilled the law. He even says that one it says jot or tittle, okay? For us, put that in American language, one I dotted, one T crossed. Not one of those things will be out of place till all is fulfilled. And Jesus fulfilled the law. And in the book of Hebrews, it says, that which is old is ready to vanish away forever. So I would encourage you to understand the law, read the law, and understand the perfection that it tried to bring. There were 613 laws. But the book of Hebrews tells us the entire point was not for us to live under that for eternity. It was to bring us to the point of going, oh my goodness, this is impossible. And God is saying, take heart, I'm going to send my son. He's going to complete it, and now all you have to do is put your faith in him. And that gets criticized a lot because you're going, well, if I just have to put my faith in him, then that means I can go out and break all the laws. No, because if you are of the Spirit, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The more you realize you are Spirit, you will begin to walk in the Spirit. There are three parts, Spirit, soul, and body. You are a Spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. But you are a Spirit identity. Does this make sense? So the whole goal in this life is to understand who you are, identity. I am a spirit. I am a son of God. Uh, we're going to read in here that it says that the spirit inside of us cries out, Abba, Father. And the more you understand who you are in the spirit, your soul starts to get a little freaked out. And it's going, well, wait a second. I thought I was this. I thought I was that. We talked about this a little bit last week about identity. We start to get confused. The more you press into the Lord, the more your soul fights against you because all the, your soul can operate in is in your five senses, which gets played out in your body. But the more in faith you understand who you are in the spirit, the right living automatically is produced. Because people always say, well, what about right living? and I'm going to steal this, uh, great man of God, Joseph Prince, says it like this, right believing produces right living. 
So the more you understand who you are in Christ, you will live right accidentally more than you ever tried to on purpose before in your life because you understand who you are. So, beloved, if God so loved us, also we ought to love one another. Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. Look at 12. No one has seen God at any time. No one. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Do you realize that proof positive of God's perfected love inside of you is your ability to love other people? Which means the opposite is true. If we are incapable of loving other people, his love is not perfected in us. So in essence, our disobedience to love other people stops the perfectedness of God. Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. Do you believe that Jesus loves us? Do you believe that he proved that on the cross? Do you know that we can sub, we can halt the will of God by not loving other people? Because what, what, what is our word for 2020? Transference. We receive the love of God, but then we keep it to ourselves instead of transferring that love to other people. It says no one has seen God at any time. Has anyone in here seen the face of God? Okay. I would, if you put your hand up, I would want to talk to you later. It's, and, and what is the point of that? It's saying you can't tell people on the street that don't know Jesus, well, you know, you should just see the face of God. You should just you ask God to reveal himself to you. We are the revelation of God in the earth. Jesus says he was the light of the world. Then he tells us we are the light of the world. Because Jesus believed in transference. Everything he had, he said that he gave it to the apostles and that they were to transfer it to other people. And the number one thing is love. People are not going to know God unless you're radically loving them. And radically loving them does not mean agreeing with what they do. When Jesus radically loved the woman caught in adultery, did he approve of her lifestyle? No, because he told her to go and sin no more. But he loved her where she was at. He didn't look at her and say, what are you, an idiot? Why are you doing this? You just almost got yourself killed. What's the matter with you? He loved her where they're at, and he actually dealt with the hearts of the people that had wanted to kill her. Now, it was the law that if you were caught in adultery, you were to be stoned. But Jesus is not dealing with that law and saying that's not right because it was a law given from God. What he's talking about is you have hatred in your hearts. Your whole intent of bringing this woman here is to trap me, and you could care less about this woman. You just assume kill her to prove me wrong. And so he didn't deal with the woman's sin. He dealt with their hearts. Maybe we could look at that in ourselves instead of us worrying about God dealing with other people's sins, instead of worrying about our hearts going, is it going to prevent us from loving other people knowing that they're living a sinful lifestyle? Instead, it was the thing that compelled Jesus more than ever was to love sinners. His hardest part was dealing with religious people. But tax collectors, prostitutes, people of the night, those are the people that he went to. It says, when we were in the midst of our sin, Jesus died for us. So verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We're going to actually look at this word later, perfected. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, somebody might say that John, the, uh, John, the writer of this, took, a, took, took a, a hard turn here because this whole thing has been about love so far, right? Love, 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 love. But then it says... Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. I want you to understand, he didn't take a right turn off of love and go on to the spirit. What he's showing us is that love is spiritual. 
The evidence of the Holy Spirit living in us is not the gifts. Now, the Bible says that God give that the Spirit gives gifts as he discerns, as he chooses. Well, how can the Spirit give gifts if he's not living on the inside of you? So the, the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is not about the giftings that you have. That comes as a result of the Spirit living in you. The Spirit lives in you because you are born from above, and, be, and, the, and the evidence of the Spirit in you is love. Why do we know this? Because in Galatians 5, it says the fruit of the Spirit is what's the very first one mentioned, love. And I don't remember if you were in here, but we did a teaching on 1 Corinthians 13 and showed that all of the other eight fruits of the Spirit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control, can all be found in the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. So really, the other eight um, fruits of the Spirit are just complementing love. So in essence, we could say the fruit of the Spirit is love, full stop. And the rest just describe what love looks like. Having joy, having peace, having patience. I mean, you know, because some people are like, well, I just really love God and all of this kind of stuff, but they're never at peace. They never have joy. They're always flying off the handle. That's not love. We are given the definition of love. So don't get confused by verse 13. He's not talking about the Spirit and just took a tangent off of love. The Spirit is love. How do we know this? Because the Spirit is God, right? Three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all God. And yet we already know that the Bible says God is love. So when the Holy Spirit comes in, in you, it is literally putting his love on the inside of you. And by this, it says that we know that we abide in him because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord in your life is also a part of love. Because it just got done saying that if we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit, we just established that the spirit is also love. It says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It's all about love. We have come to know and have believed the love, there it is again, which God has for us. God is love. It's the second time it said that. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. You wonder why Satan attacks the concept of love in this world more than anything, because he knows that this isn't just the signature trait of God. It is God. God is love. Now, this is where we actually get our verse for Seven Mountains Church, um, where we say, as he is, so are we. By this, love is perfected within us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. How is that possible? Because Jesus' love was perfected on the cross. We are to receive his love, and the only way that love is perfected is us is when we love one another, when we transfer that love. It's not about giving people the theology of Jesus Christ. It's not about getting them to, you know, like, like twisting their arm to get a confession out of them. They must receive the love from us so that they say, oh my goodness, I want to worship this Jesus. I want to confess him as Lord and Savior because what you are demonstrating to me is this radical life of love that I know that I want. Love is the main concept in all of Scripture. Jesus is the embodiment of love because in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave. 
Who did he give? He gave Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God's love. Look at 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And we just talked about what is perfected love. God's love for us and then our ability to love other people. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. How many of us have had some fears? So this message is for us. If we want to move past fear, we need to move into the perfection of love. Courage is not the opposite of fear. Love is the opposite of fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Not a carnal love, not a worldly love. Perfected love casts out fear. Because fear involved punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. 19. We love because he first loved us. There it is again. The new commandment. Not the letter of the law. Love God and love people. The new commandment. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister in Christ, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. I know I've struggled with this in my life. You convince yourself that you are a lover of God, yet many people tick you off. How many of you sometimes could be in your Facebook feed for five minutes and be ticked off within just five minutes? And when you're like, I don't like feeling like this, and you shut it away, you begin to see faces and images in your mind. Be careful. I see this all the time. I watch things where people are, 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 are um, doing men on the street interviews in the abortion rallies. I mean, this, con- th- th- this thing is becoming more and more sick. And I know you may be thinking, Pastor, you talk about abortion a lot, and I do because it's the murder of children. And that should be a big deal, don't you think? But they were interviewing this woman, and I remember a time, I'm only 40, but I remember a time where a, abortion was kind of a, you, you just didn't talk about it. I mean, people wanted it legalized because they believed it was their choice, but it was never, when I was young, it was never celebrated, ever. It was like, well, I just feel like this is what I need to do. I'm too young to have a baby, or I'm this, or I'm that. And I'm not saying that it was right then. It was still just as wrong then. But I'm saying it was not celebrated. In the same way, many things when I was younger were not celebrated, like having sex before marriage or things like that. People did it. And they wanted the right to do it, but it was not celebrated. Now evil is celebrated right out in the open. You have celebrities, and you have people in these things. I, I, just, I just saw it all on the other day on Facebook that some, somebody who has a late show, I guess she's a comedian or something, I didn't even recognize her name, but she made this statement, and they had the audio clip of the, the rally that's taking place in D.C. because Louisiana, I don't know if you know this, has a bill before the Supreme Court. And so this was a pro-abortion rally, and... This person, she's a comedian or late night talk show or something, got up and said, I am so happy that I have my corner office by the windows. I drive my hybrid car to this job where I make a lot of money, and it's all due to the fact that I could have an abortion. This person elevated a car a career, money, and an office, a corner office, and dedicated it to killing your child. And some of you may think, well, that's really extreme. The majority is not like that. Buckle up, it'll get like that. 
And if you've ever seen interviews from these rallies, it's becoming like that. It's no longer like, well, I know it's sin and I know it's wrong, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm just going to keep it undercover. I'm not going to broadcast it. There are videos. I saw another video where someone... Uh, it, it, posted on Facebook, it went viral, that someone created a TikTok video where the, she was in front of the mirror, you know, her stomach was out to here. It starts off looking like she's celebrating this life of the child, and the rest of the video is about her going to the abortion clinic, and when she gets the abortion, she does this. It's sick. It's demonic. But what, what I'm telling you all this is the point is, is if we are not careful, we will take this demonic sin and place it on people. This young lady and this comedian late night talk show person needs to be prayed for to receive Jesus Christ. But if we move into a place of hate and not hating the sin, but hating the sinner, we will not pray for them. That doesn't mean that we acknowledge what this person did was good. There's a lot of things politicians do that I think are just absolutely crazy. But we should be praying for them because the only thing that's going to happen is if we can change their mind and that they can have the love of God because the positions that they're in can be influential if their lives are changed for God. The things that are being shut down on social media all the time, you have to really dig to find them. But people that believed in transgenderism and actually had the procedures done later find Jesus, and they're trying desperately to get the word out to tell people this was the biggest mistake of their lives. But it's being shut down because this is a sin we celebrate now. We need to be praying that the same people, before they even get these procedures done, would come to the love, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the radical love for other people, so that before they get these procedures done, and then the friends that are celebrating them doing it, they can get a hold of them too. It's the only way it's going to happen. Amen. So when you encounter these things, do not shift your hatred towards the person doing it. You need to be angry at sin. You need to stay angry at that because that's the problem that's going on is people have become complacent and we are no longer offended or angry at sin. The fact that people are celebrating the murder of babies out in the open should be appalling to us. And if it's not, there's other heart issues going on inside of us. We're worried about coronavirus, and we're killing millions of babies every year. What a world. But do not, I repeat, in love, do not put that sin on them. Jesus, when he saw the woman caught in adultery, he hates adultery. It ruins lives. It ruins marriages. He hates it, but he loved the woman. That's supernatural, and that's, that's the love that we need. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have for him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. We have no right, no right whatsoever to boast in our love for God if we do not love our brothers and sisters. And isn't it interesting that it talks about just your brothers and sisters in Christ? Could it be that John knows something that was not only happening in his day, but still goes on today, that we can meet in a house like this and have issues with the very people that may be sitting three chairs over from us? This isn't even talking about the world, but we know that this applies to the world also because when the rich man comes to Jesus and says, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, well, you know, love God and love people. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story about the Samaritan who takes care of the Jew 
which they hated each other. They were not brothers and sisters in Christ. So it applies to both. But if we can't even love our brothers and sisters that are either seated in this sanctuary with us or that go to another church but we're friends with them from another church or whatever the case may be, if we cannot do that, how in the world are we going to love the world? I want to go over a couple words uh, with you. I found this, and it spoke to me, so I'm just going to share it with you and see if you take it in, if it has the same impact. When I read Scripture, God speaks to me about different things, and I don't know why he's speaking. I just follow it, and then I find out later. So when it talks about perfected love, that word in the Greek is the word teleao, and I put it up there because I was going to forget how to pronounce it. It's spelled T-E-L-E-I-O-O, -O, and it's pronounced teleao. And that word perfected means accomplished, finished, fulfilled, or perfect. And I was curious. I don't know why God took it and put it in my mind, but he said, look up the word when my son said it is finished. And I looked up the word finished. You know the other thing I didn't notice, ever notice this before, and this will just tell you, you know, or might make you lose confidence in me as a pastor and a studier of the word. Did you know that, how many times have we heard, you know, about how Jesus says, it is finished, right? Did you know that it's only in the Gospel of John that he says that? Now, the Gospels record many things. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'll say, I thirst, and they gave him the vinegar and all of that kind of stuff. But it is only in the Gospel of John when he says, he cried out, it is finished. And, the, and in the Gospel of John, this is the same John that writes 1 John. The word finished in the Greek is teleo. Looks very similar to the other word, doesn't it? And it's pronounced teleo instead of teleao. And it means accomplished, end, finished, fulfilled, paid. Why is this significant? Because if Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. What did he finish? He put an end to sin. He finished the fullness of of demonstrating the Father's love. He demonstrated the Father's love through healing the sick, commissioning the 12, raising the dead, all of that kind of stuff. Those were all pieces of love, and he did everything according to what his Father says. But he's saying the final act of the command from my Father, I'm done, it is finished. And it means accomplished, in, finished, fulfilled, and paid. That was the final act of love that he did on the cross. And it says that perfected love drives out fear. It says God's love is perfected in us when we love one another. And so this blew my mind because if Jesus says it's accomplished, it's finished, it's fulfilled, it's paid, and the same word associated with a real kind of love means accomplished, finished, fulfilled, and perfect. That means what Jesus did at the cross was perfect. And what it also means is that his finished work at the cross is perfected in our lives, in other people's lives, when we love one another. So in a sense, you could say it like this. When we love one another, Jesus' love is complete. It's finished. It's fulfilled. Jesus' act of love in it of himself was finished at the cross. But the actual act of love is not finished until we love one another. Because otherwise, we just receive from Jesus at the cross and we don't carry it out. And it really, according to the scriptures we just read, you cannot say that you receive the love of God. You cannot say that you know God. You understand the sacrifice. You cannot say any of that until it is transferred to other people. In the same way, God could say all day long from heaven, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But we didn't really understand that until Jesus Christ came. 
in the same way, we cannot say back to God, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, until we love one another. He does not distinguish between the two. He does not distinguish about the fact that we can receive his love but not give it to other people. He says it's impossible. Why? You can't say you love God and hate your brother. That means you didn't receive. And how do we know this? Because what did we say about transference? You can't possess what you don't receive. And you, and you can't transfer what you don't possess. Right? So you cannot be of the fullest revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ until you're loving other people. Or at least you can't say that. And, and, and this offends people. Well, no, I know God loves me. Well, I know this, but this person just drives me nuts. This family member just drives me nuts. Just, it just, it's, I, I can't help it. It's just who I am. I was born this way. That's all baloney. If you just receive the fullness of the finished work, it manifests in love. So if you want the assurance of your salvation in Jesus Christ, the assurance that you understand what really happened on the cross, the assurance of your relationship with him, I love you when I say this. I don't care how many times you go into the secret place during the day. If you do not love other people, that is wasted time. Because whatever you're doing in the secret place is you're missing it because it's not going out. And I'm just sharing this with you because it became a revelation to me. Because I ask God, I don't know about you, I ask God all the time, Lord, what am I doing wrong? Not because I see things wrong, but I just, I, I endeavor to want to please him. And the Bible says, you are either of the spirit or of the flesh. Because we're going back to what we talked about. Love is spiritual, right? So you are either of the spirit, of love, or you are of the flesh, which is apparently not love. Not real love, not perfected love, not finished love. And so there's only two places in the Bible that it says, without this, you are unable to please God. And remember, we talked about this before. This doesn't mean that he's disappointed in you because disappointment is a reaction to an expectation. He's already seen your whole life, so he can't be disappointed. But I've asked myself, Lord, how can I please you? What can I do? Is, if I praise your name, does that bring pleasure to you? If I do this, I ask these questions. And, and what did he, where did he direct me to? His word. And it says, without faith, in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the other place is in Romans 8, where it says... If you are of the flesh, you cannot please God. And Paul constantly talks about you are either of the flesh or of the spirit. I'm not talking about getting into a seance and pulling your spirit out of your flesh. That's, you cannot do that. Your flesh cannot stand by itself. When your flesh dies, your spirit instantly leaves. It is in the presence of the Lord. But what I'm talking about is we dwell in this flesh. But we have the choice to be led by the Spirit or led by the flesh. And the Bible also says if you are led by the Spirit, that brings pleasure to God, not the flesh. If you are of faith, that brings pleasure to God. And so I would go as far as to say then if you are of love, that is what brings pleasure to God because love is spiritual. My goal is is to make this, because it's my own personal goal, is to make this as simple as possible. Because many times people in Christianity and, and are, are like, it just seems like there's just so much to know. If you made it your goal, your only aim to love people the way that Jesus loved you your whole life, I guarantee you, you will never stop bringing, you will never stop 
bringing pleasure to the Lord and you will live a great life. I don't mean great in the sense of a carnal life, a fleshly life, a worldly life. I mean, how could you go wrong if your only aim is to love others as Jesus loved you? But the only way you can accomplish that is to understand how much he really loved you. And in this, the Bible says, is love that God sent his only son. Why we spit on him, why we beat him, why we put thorns in his head, why we put nails in his wrists and in his feet. He was loving us the entire time. Not because we were lovely and not because we were righteous. Because we were the filth scum of the earth and he loved us anyway. If that's not radical love, if that's not perfected love, I don't know what it is because when Jesus cried out, it is finished, you saw how similar those words are. It comes from the same root word. Perfection and being finished. So the finish, the, the completion of God's love in us is when we love others. So if we refuse to love other people, his love is not completed. It is not finished. Jesus' work was finished, but God's love is not perfected and finished until we love others. Amen? Love is spiritual. This should be our only aim. God's going to give you spiritual gifts, and you'll learn to operate in that. If you want to learn more about it, come on Tuesdays. But love is our only aim. It's the only thing that will identify us separate from the rest of the world. The Bible says, in the end, if there are prophecy they will cease. If there's tongues, they will cease. All of the gifts will cease. Why? Because when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus face to face, we don't need those gifts anymore. But love remains. Love endures. Why? Because God is love, and God, and so therefore, love never came into existence. It's always been. And it always will be, because God is never ending. We're going to move into a time of worship. And so, if you've been here many weeks, if you're new here, I'm still going to go through the instruction. There are communion tables in the back. Jesus says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he says, my words are spirit and life. The flesh profits nothing. He's not talking about cannibalism, but he is talking about in the spirit, you must consume every part of him. And he says, then I will remain in you and you will remain in me. So we invite you to do that during this time. We invite you for a freedom of worship, whatever posture you want to take during worship. We also invite you, if you want to be ministered to or have prayer, we would ask that you would sit and put your hand up and someone will come and minister to you. Whether it's for healing, whether it's something, maybe you just need to cry on the shoulders of someone and saying, I just had a revelation breakthrough of love. I just want to share it with you. Whatever your need is, whatever you want to do, just sit and put your hand up. But we are going to worship. And we're going to worship as a response to God's love for us.